Welcome to the Seven Figure Fundraising Podcast, the podcast where we discuss specific tactics and strategies to grow your nonprofit. I'm your host, Trevor Bragdon. Today's interview is a slightly different format. I'm interviewing two guests in marketing experts, Rory Sutherland and Maddie Croucher, who both work for the global advertising and marketing agency Ogilvy. Rory Sutherland is the vice chairman of Ogilvy in the United Kingdom and is the co-founder of Ogilvy's behavioral science practice, which focuses on seeking out the unexpected changes that can transform the way people think and act. And he's also the author of the excellent book, Alchemy, The Surprising Power of Ideas That Don't Make Sense. Maddie Croucher is a senior behavioral science consultant at Ogilvy, and she specializes in working with nonprofit organizations. Maddie graduated from the University of York with a BS in psychology, and prior to joining Ogilvy, she worked as a researcher in cognitive neuroscience lab at the University of Oxford. This is a really fun interview, and you're going to learn a lot from both of them and the interesting way they look at the world and test and learn how we engage with it. I wanted to talk specifically with you, Rory, about how nonprofit leaders can build trust with their donors. You founded the Behavioral Science Practice and this division where Maddie works specifically with nonprofits. And when you founded it, you had this mantra of wanting to test intuitive things because no one else does. So can you tell us about why that's important and what you found doing that? Yeah, I think that business, when it, and the same increasingly applies to the charitable sector, it tends to use both economics and market research as its two ways of understanding the world of consumer or donor behavior. And I think both of them are limited. First of all, because in truth, market research can only tell you so much. There's a wonderful quote often attributed to David Ogilvy that the trouble with market research is that people don't think what they feel, they don't say what they think, and they don't do what they say. And that this is, broadly speaking, by the way, true in psychological terms, that a large part of our deeper motivation is kind of opaque to introspection. In other words, we have kind of unthought needs, uh, if you like, which we're never going to tell you about in research because we're not even aware of them ourselves. And then there are the limits of economics, which tends to assume a very, very rationalist, individualist approach to understanding human behavior. And both these fields are problematic in two ways. One, they can be wrong, which is obviously a problem in itself, but also they can be very creatively limiting because the only things you're ever allowed to test or experiment with are the things that kind of make logical sense and which people in market research say, that's a marvelous idea. Now, just to give an example of an innovation where, as a copywriter in a direct marketing agency, I think I was ahead of the curve. I'd long believed that there was a huge value in going to people and asking for very small regular donations through what we in the UK call direct debits or recurrent payments. And I always felt that starting small with, you know, it's almost like an ask you can't refuse to misquote the godfather, you know, two bucks a month, three bucks a month, that somehow, and I was instinctively right, because we now know of this in behavioral science as the foot in the door effect, that if you're already giving $3 a month, it's much easier mentally to up that to eight or 10 or 15 than it is to go from naught to 15. And so I'd always had this feeling And when we were working on charity clients back in the early 90s, I used to repeatedly say, rather than getting 5% of your donor base to give you $200, why don't we occasionally try to get 50% of the donor base to give you $2 a month? And it was a few years before anybody tried it, and it turned out to be one of the most significant charity fundraising ideas ever. In the same way, in market, now economically, that's not logical. If you're willing to give eight, whether you're already giving two or not should be irrelevant. In terms of economics, that's a nonsensical idea. In market research, I don't think people would tell you that. Nobody in market research would say, I'd be much more likely to give money to a charity if you enclosed a free pen with the envelope either, because people present themselves as being more rational than they really are. And what, of course, the free pen does is it's not only making the process of a donation easier, because at least you've got a pen, okay? But there's also something which Robert Cialdini has 
written about, which is called reciprocation bias. That if someone's kind of given me something, I owe them, at the very least, I owe them the time of day. And that has, by the way, an important bearing in terms of trust, because one of the interesting things about trust is it is a two-way street. And one way to inculcate trust in your customers is, first of all, to show that you trust them. Right. And that's probably why you see, too, like even the, you know, pens, but you also see people putting in quarters into, at least in the U.S., you see like quarters and even dollar bills put into mailings, you know, with the idea that if I give you a little money, you'll give it back. And I assume that has some backfire a little bit, but it does seem to be an effective strategy. It's probably a case where it got a bit overused. I think in its height, you you know, everybody was effectively acquiring a charity pen collection. But what's interesting about behavioral science is we don't just look at it as we know that a pen works. We have a kind of structure for a kind of mental mug tree on which we can hang findings like that and say, what do these various findings teach us and where can we replicate them in a different and maybe more creative way? I have often, you know, we had a very interesting discussion with Nespresso about recycling. And one of the things I said is one of the ways in which you can get people to recycle is just to trust people. It's just to say, we will give you this offer of money off coffee, but in return, we just re- demand or we just ask that you pledge. So my contention was that by demonstrating that you trust people, all we ask you to do is make this commitment. We're not, like, we're not going to ask you to attach barcodes to every single capsule you return. We're not going to come around and visit your house. You know, all we ask you to do is just to promise that you will do this. And my hunch was that this program might be more successful simply because it, it demonstrates trust to begin with mm-hmm. than a program that was actually more accurately measured and um, quantified. And what were the results of what happened when you guys tested? We haven't done it yet. This was a discussion. And I think that can be damaging for trust because trust is all about, to some extent, the benefit of the doubt. It's both parties, as in a marriage, in any relationship, a commercial relationship. It's both parties to the exchange having a certain degree of, I'm going to give you the benefit of this one. There's a Dutch word, chun, which I think is spelt G-U-N, but pronounced obviously with a large amount of spittle because it's Dutch, which conveys that, which is, I'm going to throw in an extra so-and-so, so-and-so, just for the chun. And it's a kind of concept of reciprocal goodwill, you know. And it's a useful concept, which I think perhaps the Anglo-Saxon languages have lost a little bit. Right. And that's why you see like five guys does the extra handful of fries at in the transaction it's beautiful Uh, five guys is very very interesting from a behavioral point of view because first of all it's kind of hypothecation in that the burger is very expensive um extremely expensive if you compare it to mcdonald's but then with the exception of the milkshake which is also expensive everything else is actually really generous you get an extra scoop of fries even if you've just ordered the small fries they fill your cup and then they take this extra scoop and throw it in the bottom of the bag All the toppings are free, the peanuts are free, the refills are free. So Five Guys is an interesting psychological case where understands the psychology of price. You don't mind spending a lot of money on a burger because you feel that the money you spend extra on a burger is kind of discernibly worthwhile. You know, I'm going to notice the difference. But at the same time, it makes everything else you buy pretty reasonable. And I went to the UK Treasury and said, what you should do is you should learn from Five Guys And income tax, if you said income tax, only goes towards education and health. And you hypothecated all income tax towards those two worthwhile causes of free health care and education. It would be much, much easier to get people to pay 1% more income tax than if they feel the money is just disappearing into a more. Now, why, of course, this is relevant, the whole question of hypothecation, is in charities, you know exactly this conflict which is the finance, you know you'll get more donations if you have what's called the identifiable victim effect. All of your money will go towards mosquito nets. All of your money will go towards this particular cause. And that helps you raise money. But the finance people, just like the UK Treasury, always hate the idea because it means they have money now which is committed to a particular thing rather than money they can move around. And that tension has always been present in the charity sector. Right. Well, it's one of those challenges where you want to be sure you're raising money in the most effective way possible, and you find these specific venues that work really well, but you can fund a wide variety of things with that money. So keeping it broad enough, but also specific. 
So, Maddie, I have a question for you. You know, this whole counterintuitive testing that you do in your department, what are some of the things you've learned working with your nonprofit clients with these counterintuitive tests or testing counterintuitive things, rather? I think kind of my key takeaway would be like to never assume the true motivations of your donor and always underestimate like how much their decisions are swayed by their own needs rather than actually necessarily their desire to be like altruistic. So, I think. While we like to really believe that we're all inherently selfless, I think donor decision making is actually often largely about themselves rather than about the charity and the cause itself, whether they admit it themselves or whether they'd even like consciously realize it. Um, So I think this is something that behavioral science really reveals and actually taps into kind of this notion that actually appealing to rational reasons for donating often don't work. And I think more broadly, A kind of one really nice example, I think, that demonstrates this is actually a bit of a throwback to a 2014 study people are probably quite familiar with uh, by Yuri Gnizzi um, on overhead aversion. I think he did a really nice study that demonstrated this this kind of sentiment quite nicely. We know that donations tend to decrease when overheads increase. I think that makes a lot of of sense. Uh, People want to see or at least feel confident in the fact that they're having some kind of tangible impact of their donation that it's going directly to the beneficiary. But interestingly, I think this only seems to apply when donors actually have to pay for the overheads themselves. And I think this is a nice cue to actually where this self-interest starts to creep in. And in this study, basically, they showed that actually when donors are informed that an initial major donor has covered these overheads, they're much more likely to take this overhead-free donation option than opt for a one-to-one matching scheme. Mm-hmm. Even even though the matching scheme would actually yield a lot more money for the charity. So in a way, they're far more uh, swayed by feeling the kind of tangible impact of that overhead free donation than the amount the charity actually receives. But I think that's quite telling of how actually we need to be mindful of the kind of donor mindset and that their kind of what motivates them is maybe different from what we expect. Um, and we need to be conscious of this. Because we discovered in one test for a client, didn't we, that actually mentioning what was effectively the fact that £10 from you is £12.50 given to the cause because you claim the tax back. We have a system in the UK where rather than claiming charitable donations against your end of year tax return, you declare that you're a taxpayer on the donation and the government effectively adds the money on. Oh, interesting. Now, bizarrely and fascinatingly, highlighting this fact decreased both the volume of donations and the size of donations quite significantly. Now, you know, you'd think if people were being truly altruistic, the fact that every pound I give is in fact one pound twenty-five of benefit would be an encouragement for more people to give and for people to give more. And yet, bizarrely, it had the opposite effect. And you, you said, interestingly, Mary, that, that saying a donor has covered our overheads and therefore 100% of your money goes to the cause is more motivating than a matching donation, even though that would make more significant difference. Yeah, because personally, you feel like you're having more of a tangible impact. Yeah, pretty really interesting. There's a lovely story about this, about the economist John Maynard Keynes, who was the bursar of Trinity College, Cambridge, and made them a fortune, by the way. He was very successful. But Trinity College, Cambridge has the chapel, which is a world-famous medieval uh, chapel, magnificent architectural thing. And it also owns the Arts Theatre in Cambridge, which is kind of, you know, a local theatre. It's nothing special and certainly not interesting architecturally. And each of them needed a million pounds to survive. And... Trinity had one million pounds to give to both of them. And what Caden said is, he said, we will give all of the million pounds to the arts theatre and we will give nothing to the chapel. (laughs) People said, that seems a bit disproportionate. He said, no, no, no. Fundraising for the chapel is really, really easy. Fundraising for the theatre is really, really difficult. I can find an American who will give $100,000 to support King's College Chapel, but I'll never find someone who will give $100,000 to support a provincial Cambridge theatre. And there's something really interesting there. So if you can find donors and say your real value as a donor is to cover our costs so that we can then say to everybody else, your donation actually is given frictionlessly to the beneficiary. Uh, It's a hugely valuable service you can perform. Right. And you've seen some great growth with nonprofits who have adopted that, like Charity Water, where they have a recurring donation model but they have their major donors cover their overhead. So 100% of their 
donations from their smaller donors go directly to programming. I think it would thing that's interesting about that whole, you know, two X your donation versus the just a hundred percent of your money goes directly to the people in need. Do you think part of that is to do with the fact that it's a simpler offer? Like 2X is kind of hard to do, or 3X that you see sometimes on letters, it's kind of hard to do the math. And you just, it seems a little unbelievable that you're having like a 3X impact where it seems a lot more believable that 100% of your money, you know, with a small donation would go directly to the people that are being helped by this charity. Just to clarify that, do you mean in terms of if part of it's going to cover overheads and part is going to the charity, that's more complex than just knowing it's all going to the one place? Yeah, just that the actual offer, when you're reading it in the letter, it seems more believable that, you know, 100% would go to this versus the 2x or 3x. Like sometimes that just seems, you know, I know this one charity who mails to our house, they have these matching grants and stuff, and they're like 4x or 6x. And you're like, really? Like, is it really going to be 6x? Like, I have no reason to not doubt them. We give them money. But on the other hand, there's still that like in the back of your head where you kind of wonder on these like, 2x, 3x, 4x matches. Is that really possible or is that true? I think that's a good point. And I think we know, I think lots of research shows that lots of people are skeptical of where money goes when you donate it to charity. So yeah, I certainly wouldn't be surprised if that extra layer of like complexity makes it more confusing for people. And we know that maybe when things are more cognitively difficult to process, our trust in them decreases just inherently. Um, through that kind of function of ease. So I think I think that makes perfect sense. Uh, that might just be harder. There's something you might almost call concreteness of promise, which is the more absolute your promise is, the harder it is to wiggle out of. And I've always noticed, for example, I've always argued that the legislation on how financial savings products and indeed loan products is presented, which is an APR, is a terrible psychological way of First of all, it it underestimates the compounding effect of of saving and underestimates the compounding cost of borrowing. Mm -hmm. So people tend to think of that as kind of an annual amount they're paying, not as the beginning of a spiral. But it's also hopelessly unconcrete. I'd need a financial calculator to check whether or not my bank was ripping me off. Whereas I always said, if you were legally allowed to have a financial product which just said double your money in 10 years, a lot of people who wouldn't dream of investing at whatever the equivalent APR is, and I haven't got a clue, 7%. Point, whatever it is, or whatever, okay? A huge number of people who wouldn't dream of investing at X percent APR. If you said double your money in 10 years, they go, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Because it's an absolute. I know, okay, I put in $10,000 now, 10 years' time, I'm going to get 20. And if I don't do that, I can complain. I don't need a calculator. I don't need a financial advisor. That's something I can get my head around. And the clarity of it and the simplicity of it undoubtedly contributes to trust. That anything that's kind of weaselly about a promise undermines trust quite significantly, I think. Well, and that brings up an interesting point that, you know, one of the things we see with nonprofits is one of the best ways to grow your donations and grow your overall revenue is increasing the percentage of your donors who give again right? Keeping that retention rate high. What are some ways, you know, this is very similar to how businesses that grow have repeat customers. What are ways that nonprofits can establish that trust so that they're more likely to have donors come back again when they renew that year or down the road a year or two from then? I think for me, it links back to like that seeing that tangible impact. I think that's something that's so important to donors. So if they can see, okay, last month or on the first ask I donated, $50. $50. This is exactly what happened and how it was spent, even so sometimes it might be a slight approximation. I think that reassurance and seeing that concrete example can really help. And you, man- you mentioned um, Charity Water as a great example of kind of being transparent about their overheads, but I think they also do a really nice job of showing donors the tangible impact of their donation. So actually they have almost, it's quite cool, they have like this live map where they actually show the different clean water projects um, in all these different locations. You can click on them, you can see photos of the communities interacting with these projects. And I think that tangibility really reinforces that sense of trust that encourages people to continue donating over time because they can almost follow the story of the people they're helping. I completely agree. The concretization of things is 
really, really important. I've always thought that, by the way, in environmental movements, you know, it would be a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of sleight of hand. But if you told people, okay, you can get on a more expensive electricity tariff, but it's much greener. And then you said, and here's your windmill. <laughs> okay. You can actually watch it live on YouTube. Now, okay, we all know. You know, I mean, you know, I know perfectly well that there's an electricity grid connecting us and that the power from the windmill does not come directly to power by television. But nonetheless, we are physical creatures living in a digital world. And anything that makes something seem sort of tangible, that anything that sort of restores an idea of physical connection uh, has to be valuable in that. Right. And you have that great example in your book where you talk about the, I think it was a bank that tested the two different ways of getting people to respond. And one was, I think they got money back. And then the other one was a penguin. They got like a little toy penguin light. It was actually an energy company, yes. And it was um, C C Cedric the Penguin. And uh, at one stage, I think they had a prize draw, which was you could win free energy for a year, which is worth, you know, a few thousand dollars, particularly to a dual fuel customer. You know, it's a pretty valuable thing to win. And I can't remember, they got something like 50,000 or 100,000 entries. And the next year, you could win one of 100 um, Cedric nightlights for your child, which was a nightlight in the shape of the penguin, which was featured in their advertising. And they got about a million, ent million entries for that. And one person, in fact, was offered $200 uh, or thereabouts compensation for a billing error and replied, I don't want the $200. I want you to send me a penguin. And so, no, I mean, it's, uh, there are wonderful experiments like this. And direct marketers, of course, were in many ways, and I include charity marketers in that, direct marketers were the original behavioral scientists in a funny kind of way because if you look at the history of it all credit to the uh, marketing industry a b split tests of advertising copy uh, they were being performed in the late victorian era they're being performed in the 1890s medicine didn't really cotton on to the idea of those kind of randomized control trials for about another 50 years and so one of the things that everybody learned in direct marketing very quickly was that the standard economic models of define a kind of fake idea of human rationality are have terrible predictive power that i mean you know one of the great experiments i think mentioned in daniel kahneman's book is that uh, it made more difference to the response rate to a loan mailing to show a happy smiling person on the phone in a picture uh, than it did if you reduce the apr and so what triggers we need to prompt action are often, in other words, the information that's generating our emotions is often of, and, and emotions, after all, drive most actions. Most of our actions are emotionally driven deep down. I won't say all, but most of them are. Even, even in B2B, by the way, B2, business decision-making pretends to be rational in order as a kind of defensive mechanism, so I don't get blamed for anything. But most business decisions are taken emotionally. And the interesting thing is that the kind of information that drives our emotional response is very different to the kind of information that rationalist people assume is important and decisive. So, you know, I once didn't buy a house because the guy seemed a bit iffy. It's, I won't go into the whole details, but this was a massive transaction. It involved moving house. And he'd said when I went round, well, I'm pretty sure he'd said, OK, um, and by the way, I'll include the fridge and the appliances. And then when it came to finalise, we'd already spent money on a survey. He said, no, no, no the fridge isn't included. I said, okay, well, that's fine. Now, how much do you want to leave the fridge? Now, the fridge was four years old. The, what you might call the Hun Dutch solution is to say, let's call it half price. And we all split the difference, okay? It's not economically accurate, but it's kind of a gesture of kind of good faith. And then no, no, he wanted the replacement cost of the fridge. So he wanted me to pay for a new fridge. Bear in mind, he was moving 400 miles away, so the chance that the fridge would have survived the journey was fairly low, I would have thought. And I was so annoyed and incensed by that that I refused to buy the house. Now, an economist would say that was a ludicrously emotional uh, reaction and that to use suspicious behaviour on the part of the seller as a reason not to buy and to influence a six-figure decision is absurd. 
Not quite. If you look at it in evolutionary terms, because some friends of ours then tried to buy the same house and they did a different survey and discovered that a large part of the garden didn't actually belong to him. <laughs> so my instinctive reaction that this guy is not wholly straight, okay, avoid. Um, even I at the time thought I'm being a bit irrational here. I'm really acting out of peak. But the evolutionary reason for it is, is when you think about it, quite sound. You know, the one thing we can't afford in the in evolutionary setting is to be naively trusting. And therefore, any sign that the chap was borderline psychopathic, which I think he was, you know, not to slip the value of a fridge, was good enough to say, actually, give these people a wide berth. Because that's, you know, most of the clues that determined survival on the savannah were not kind of economic data. You know, it was instinctive decisions about who your friends are. So how can nonprofits, like thinking of those sort of things where you can have these just little signals of that really, you know, destroy trust, you know, you had a verbal agreement that the fridge was included, then it's, you know, he takes it away or renegotiates at the last minute, those sort of things, you're not going to have the exact same environment when you're with a nonprofit talking with perhaps a major donor. But what are some ways you can really avoid sending those signals that you're not trustworthy when you really are? Or maybe the flip side of that, and a better way to ask this question is, what are ways that you can establish greater trust with your donors in signaling that you are following through, that you are going to do exactly what you say you are with these donations and these money? There's a complicated one where this becomes more difficult in charities than it is with commercial companies. Because one way in which you can establish a kind of trust is by doing things that nobody asked you to do or expected you to do, okay? So, for example, writing to thank people for a donation. Now, it gets a bit debatable with a charity because every penny you spend on signaling is a penny that isn't going to the cause. And so it's obviously difficult and much more difficult. In a commercial entity, the example, we've already mentioned five guys where – Unasked for, unexpectedly, they always give you this extra scoop of fries. If you check in at a Doubletree hotel, they have a little oven under the reception desk, which keeps cookies warm. And they welcome you uh, with their signature Doubletree cookies. Now, when I first arrived as a Brit, we called them biscuits in any case. I was kind of like, oh, for God's sake, I'm signature cookies. But they are actually fantastically delicious. I took them onto to the room and I oh, I'm, I'm going to have one of your signature cookies. And they were fabulous. Rather sweetly, during the COVID crisis, because people couldn't stay at the Doubletree Hotel, they published the recipe online, which I thought was actually rather enchanting. Now, apparently, the finance director has been trying to kill these cookies for years, and the marketing director, quite rightly, sees them as two things. First of all, they're a distinctive feature. They're something that nobody else does. You know, I haven't stayed in a double tree for years, but if my PA said, what do you, where do you want to stay, the Hilton or the double tree, I'd go cookies, double tree. So anything that's distinctive is really useful. Anything that people weren't expecting you to do kind of communicates double. And it's also kind of an act of hospitality and generosity. No one, by the way, just a little challenge for anyone listening, no one's cracked the way of making checking out of a hotel seem fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So various people have experienced it's the peak end rule. You'll know this from your time at the LSE. You know, something that's the peak of the experience, in other words, one amazing thing, and how an experience begins and ends has a disproportionate effect on the memory of our experience compared to everything else. You know, Daniel Kahneman talks about the, you know, the beautiful symphony we listen to where there's a horrible screech in the last five seconds. Now, you know, it ruined it would be our idea. But of course, we'd enjoyed most of the symphony with no expectation of the screech. Something that comes at the end or the beginning disproportionately affects our perception. And no one, no one in the hotel industry has yet managed to make checkout a magical experience. If anybody's got an idea for it, we'd love to hear from you. In fact, don't, don't tell us. Start your own hotel chain. But it's more difficult doing a cookie thing in a charitable setting, and I understand that, because there's this conflict between signalling, and signalling has to be a little bit costly. But digital does provide you with opportunities there, because if you send someone a postcard to say thank you, then uh, that's costly and there's money going to the postal authority. Digital, if you made a little film and emailed it with someone saying thank you, a personal film, 
that's effort signaling rather than costly signaling. And we're probably okay with that, to be honest. So, you know, digital media provide, I think, charitable organizations with opportunities to signal gratitude and, uh, and sincerity through effort rather than expenditure. I think you make a really interesting point there around costly signaling being kind of a fine line in the charitable sector. And it links back to our conversation about overheads. It's like we want it to work in a subtle way. But if we go too far over the line, people think, oh, you're spending too much, too much on something kind of seemingly unnecessary. Uh, but we actually ran a really interesting trial using this principle of costly signaling um, a couple of years ago. Uh, with a charity in the UK who were doing a kind of door-to-door envelope donation campaign. Um, so volunteers go around, post envelopes through the door, and then collect them at the end of the week. And in one of these conditions, we were trying to use this idea of a costly signal to really kind of make this this charity and this cause feel like it was more valuable and more worthwhile kind of engaging with. Um, and I think the way we were hoping this would work is that by exerting this very small kind of extra cost in the envelope, which kind of signal that the charity themselves believe in and are committed to their own cause, so you should too. Um, So what we did was super simple, just change none of the messaging, none of the imagery, nothing to do with the appeal, but just slightly increase the paper stock on the envelope from 90 GSM to 150 GSM. So it's slightly thicker, slightly more weighty and felt a bit more substantial. And actually what we found was massive. So just this compared to a control saw a 14% increase in donations and also significantly increasing donations over £100. So I think that's a nice example where if you get the balance of costly signaling right and it's subtle enough to work like on a subconscious level, then it can be really effective. Uh, You've got to be very careful not to go too far the other way and potentially turn donors off. There was an interesting supplementary finding, which is the number of donations above £100 was significantly higher with a more expensive envelope. Yeah, so it particularly appealed to those those donors. But there is something, if you think about it, if you get an expensive envelope, I'll give the extreme case, okay? Nobody listening to this podcast, I'm willing to bet on this, absolutely, okay? Nobody has ever thrown away a FedEx envelope unopened. Because the thinking is, you've spent, you know, X dollars sending this to me. You know, at the very least, something you've sent at that expense must be important enough for me to look at. And in the same way, you can make the mistake of making everything too cheap where effectively it feels disposable. And I think that I think that's a really important thing that um, you know that we can you can make the mistake of allowing the accountants too much power because it's worth remembering they don't just have cost saving arguments they have moral arguments on their side. But at the same time given that some donor is a volunteer in this case was donating their time to deliver the envelopes you owe it to those volunteers to give them as good a bang for their buck as they can possibly have. So I think um, I think that's an interesting case. I also, by the way, I'm also very, very interested in the potential for Zoom fundraising. Uh, Madeline, you can cover your ears. Madeline and my all my colleagues get absolutely sick of me going on about this. But I actually think that the fact that the world's had a crash course in video conferencing is a massively significant event. The fact that you know even people in their 80s now know basically how to join a Zoom call. And we do know from fundraising that if you do it collectively, it's much more powerful than if you try and do it one person at a time. So the ability to do kind of fundraising webinars, particularly if your donation can be made public, perhaps optionally, okay? But the option for that kind of thing, which has no... Now, what you've got to remember is, of course, um, previously you could do that. It was called a fundraising dinner, but there were enormous fixed costs. And, you know, it, you know, you had venue hire, you had food costs, you had hospitality costs. The magic of Zoom is, although the cost and actually the environmental cost is negligible because you have great big server farms processing this very call, uh, nonetheless, the ability to fundraise in a way that's social but incredibly cost-effective is new. Okay, we never really, you know, we never really had a way of doing that before. And so the potential, I think, you know, you can have a live outside broadcast from the place the money is spent. You can get people to invite their friends. There's no constraints on numbers anymore. I think, you know, the first few charities to crack that might be onto a bit of a winner. It will require some experimentation, but the potential is definitely there. Sorry, Maddie. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I promise you that's Zoom evangelism over for the week. Okay. <laughs> no, but I think that's a really good point. And there's a lot 
like we've seen just people starting doing that sort of innovation with Zoom, like even with referrals, like you have a major donor who has a friend who also has capacity to be a major donor, getting them to agree for a Zoom call, a 15, 20 minute Zoom call to introduce them to the CEO of the nonprofit can be really effective. And you're agreeing to 20 minutes. You're not agreeing to a meeting. You're not agreeing to an ask. So you get that initial like trust signaling that we've been discussing, but you also get to see their face. And, you know, older donors tend to have done business face to face most of their life. So you get some of those benefits without the downside of the cost and all of that. And actually, if you wanted celebrities or when I say celebrity in, in its broader sense, significant people to commit their time to a Zoom call. The level of commitment involved when it doesn't require your physical presence is about 10. I've got a vague theory, which I call Sutherland's Law, which is that apart from, say, Barack Obama and Tony Blair, practically everybody on the planet would give you an hour of their time on Zoom for a thousand bucks. OK, or less, obviously. But there are very, very few people on the planet who someone says it's a thousand dollars and I want you to spend an hour on Zoom. Now, previously, if you said I want you to turn up in central London on Wednesday at 6 p.m., you'd be going, oh, God, I was hoping to go on holiday that week. And um, oh, goodness, well, I'm already doing two things that day. And, you know, da, 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 da. the actual cost of time when you remove the commitment of place is inordinately reduced. So, you know, the opportunity to get a really, you know, a really interesting spokesman or, uh, you know, or whatever uh, to attend and to host these events is, again, completely transformed. The whole economics have changed. Right. Well, and I think, too, if you incorporate, you know, you can get a good guest because of that whole, you know, it's not a big ask to be on for an hour. But then if you also incorporate like a physical component, we do that with our fundraising training. We did this switch where we're going to do digital Uh, live taught training for the entire year, but we still send a workbook and a whole package. So you're writing physically in your spit at your, you know, home or your office, wherever you're taking the class. And there's that physical component, you know, it's printed on nice paper too, (laughs) because of, uh, you know, these sort of studies. Funnily enough, you've given me an idea there, because the whole dilemma with Ogilvy is that we can work fairly effectively remotely. In many ways, people prefer it. and In many ways, they're more productive. But the thing that terrifies us is onboarding. And we've probably spent the last five years making onboarding more and more digital a process. And actually, we need to return to a world of printed material. I completely agree with you to compensate. Yeah. And you can make custom box. I mean, we use this company called Packlane, which is just prints custom boxes. They're like $5 a piece. And so it's like a special experience. You get a nice box with branding. You get to open it up. It has a workbook that you follow along in. It has another book. Like it's just a nice experience. And then you can just wait until the event to, you know, use it. You know, it's all right there in one place, ready to go. So I bet it would work really well for employee onboarding or a fundraising event. That similar idea, send that welcome package, that sort of thing. And it's, again, you don't have to be really high cost. You can just signal intentionality and really thinking it through. Because media media evaluation and the relative strengths of media are a constantly moving feast. And I always notice this because, of course, having grown up in the 80s and the 90s, and I suppose having been fairly prosperous so that you're on every goddamn database imaginable, I lived through the absolute high point of direct mail to a point where it had become absurd. And then I suddenly noticed with my kids who were born in 2001 that they are really, really excited if they receive a physical letter because they're bombarded with digital stuff, whereas a letter really means something. And so I think, you know, it sounds completely counterintuitive, but charity fundraising has to rediscover direct mail to an extent. Right. Well, especially if you're doing something that looks a little different or kind of breaks the mold of what, you know, they were familiar with, say, 10 years ago when it was or 15 years ago when it was at its peak. Maddie, what are some examples you've found of signaling or other ways that nonprofits can communicate to donors that has kind of these counterintuitive increases in donations, like that envelope example you shared? So we we talked a bit about costly signaling and in terms of exerting a bit more money, you know, thicker paper for the envelope. But I think there's some other interesting ways that we can get across a signal that doesn't actually cost anything monetary. So another example would be like time and effort 
Um, so there's a behavioral science principle called labor illusion, where we tend to attribute more value to things where we feel like lots of effort has been exerted on our, our behalf. And I think this is another way that charities can really kind of cost effectively signal to potential donors. That this is something worthwhile engaging with. So whether that's, you know, doing something handmade, whether it's, um, you know, handwritten communications can signal that quite well. I think another interesting way is actually signaling the effort of the organizations or of particular individuals in that organization and how much they've put into something. So I mentioned this um, envelope trial we did before. Actually, another nice example um, of signaling we tried out in that was to really simply put a stamp on the envelope that says hand delivered, hand collected by your local volunteer. And I think this really signals the kind of effort that the charity is going in to make this a personalized experience. It's not a mass kind of direct mail campaign. It's actually real people going door to door. Um, and we, we found this to be really effective. Again, kind of increasing donation by up to 14 percent by really simply adding this costly signal of time and effort. So I think there's lots of different ways you can you can kind of play with signaling and do some fun experiments to find out what works best. Yeah, that's a great point. And it reminds me, this charity my wife and I support, they work in Ethiopia, and they sent at Thanksgiving, the U.S. holiday Thanksgiving, they sent a colored picture that was drawn by one of the children in Ethiopia. So cost is very low. You know, they shipped them to the U.S. and they packaged them up for their donors. But it was something where you're not going to throw it away because and it went up on our fridge throughout the whole, you know, I think it was up there until after Christmas. And people who came over to our house, we talked about it and you shared it. And it stuck around for a long time because it was something that seemed like very effortful to have gotten it from Ethiopia to here, even though the actual cost was probably very low. That's a nice example. I mean, there's an interesting case, isn't there, from the effective altruism movement. We were talking about trust. And I know there's, there's one charity called Give Directly, if I'm right. And they effectively give the money digitally through mobile phones. And they identify people who are inarguably poor through, I think the rule is if you have a house that doesn't have, that is entirely made of organic material, you can be assumed to be poor. I mean, it sounds, so that's a sort of California and they're going, but surely you want your whole house to be made of organic material. But actually, if you haven't got, for example, a tin roof or you haven't got a, a breeze brought wall, it tends to be evidence of poverty. And they simply communicate by mobile phone and say, we're going to essentially give you a fairly large amount of money for, for I think it's every month for a year, and then we're going to stop. What is interesting about that is, uh, and this is a wider question about trust and generosity, by the way, is the number of people who say, you can't do that, people will become, you know, they'll spend it on drink, they'll spend it on cigarettes. In fact, the research shows that if you give the money within the, with the right framing, in other words, this is going to happen for a year, after which it's not going to happen again. Okay, that's the first point. So this is a chance for you to reinvent your life. What they found is that people spent the money in incredibly different ways. Sometimes it was educating their children. One person, they thought, oh, my goodness, this guy's a lunatic. He's bought recording equipment. But he turned himself into quite a successful musical artist because he was able to produce his own CDs and sell them. OK, and there is something there about, you know, the whole question of giving money directly and allowing people to use their own judgment as to what will best improve their life. As distinct from what you might call the charity, which is absolutely insistent that it, it, it flies in, delivers something and then disappears on the confident assumption that you've made a big difference. And so one of the things I think is interesting in this area is the simple business of giving people money, because time and time again, you get this. You, I, mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe in 1910, it was true. Maybe if you gave poor people a stack of money in 1910, they did just, you know, go out on some massive bender or gamble or whatever. Uh, it may, maybe just something's changed. But it looks as though from the effective altruism movement that trusting the person you're, give, you're helping basically works. And that's something we shouldn't forget as well. The idea that you have to police how the money is spent ain't necessarily true. Right. And probably there's like an acceptable loss rate, like 3% of people might spend it really poorly, but it's so much more efficient just giving it out that way versus having a whole team that's on the ground and all of these added, you know, overhead costs to go back to what we were discussing earlier. 
That, that, it just intrigued me. It struck me as a really worthwhile experiment. And one of the most interesting findings was that the rate of people who, as you said, effectively abused the generosity was inordinately less than even optimistic people like me would have predicted. I would have said it was sort of 10, 15 percent. But it was it was significantly less than that. And I think we, we must never forget that. And of course, people have so much more of a nuanced idea of, of what it would improve their life for themselves that an external uh, an external donor does that i think it you know i think that is a really important finding because what they find is that the people in, uh, are richer two years hence by far more than the amount given that in many cases it is life transforming wow that's great well and this reminds me of like this theme that's throughout your book rory where you talk about the importance of testing basically everything because a lot of times you just don't know what works and you have this line in there about the opposite of a good idea could also be another good idea. Uh, do you mind just talking about that a little bit? Well, since I wrote the book, I, I gave a talk about the book with Matt Ridley, who's a very well-known evolutionary biologist. And he said something which chimed with me immediately. I'd never heard it before. He said, biology is the science of exceptions. And most of the progress in biology has been not by you know, the way in which physics progress has been made, which is by finding generalizable universal laws. It's been looking at anomalies, you know, the duck-billed platypus, or in Darwin's case, the strange variation in the beaks of finches on different islands of the Galapagos, and then seeking to explain them. That's where the, and I think marketing, to take it very generally, and anything involving humans, is a science of exceptions. And what you need to do is you need to test widely enough to generate surprising results. And if you only test the things that make perfect sense to test, well, one, a lot of the time you just end up confirming your prejudices. Well, what was, you know, confirming your initial beliefs? What was the point of that? So one of the findings which is fascinating for the field of digital advertising is that the more things you test, the more valuable the discoveries you make. Now, that, that isn't just pro rata. It's not just if you test five things, the information you gain is, uh, is let's say, you know, five times as valuable as if you test one. If you test five or six things, what you learn is actually 10 times as valuable as if you test one. And their theory is behind this that by being forced to test 10 things, you test 10 things that never really occurred to you to test before. And you often find that these things which are all seemingly on the tangential or irrelevant side of your general metrics are the things that make the really big difference. You know, we've had, we've had examples with call center scripts where just changing four words uh, doubles the rate of conversion. You know, simply most people do this. A magical little phrase, like most people do this, but if you like, you can do something else. Instead of saying, you can do this, you can do this, you can do that. And human psychology is such that there are butterfly effects all over the place. And it's the butterfly effects that, are, you know, the, the anomalies, the weird patterns that are really, really valuable. And so one of the vital things is, I think, if you, the problem with the insistence that everything you try must be perfectly logical is that the really big paybacks come for things that you never expected, you know. The, the Dyson vacuum cleaner makes no sense, really. I mean, no one logical would have said there was a market for a $700 vacuum cleaner 10 years ago. And yet, what do we have? You know, and I could have given loads of logical reasons. I could have said, look, first of all, you know, there's already a top of the range vacuum cleaner. That's about $400. Anybody who can afford $800 for a vacuum cleaner probably doesn't even vacuum their own house. They've got a cleaner, so why should they care? Loads and loads of rational objections. But it's still worth testing things because, of course, the logical things have already been tested, to, you know, to death. We already know the things that are the result of logical testing. And the things that really pay off, you know, big time are the kind of outside bets, the things that don't make sense because they're counterintuitive uh, or otherwise unexpected. You know, and, you know, I imagine when we did that wonderful test on those, you know, the more expensive envelopes, people were thinking, you know, these people are kind of crazy. Who on earth would be influenced in how much they gave by the, you know, the GSM weight of an envelope? And yet it turns out that so much of our perception is kind of unconscious that it's often the things that the logical brain thinks are insane, which actually drive the emotional brain to act. Right. Well, and that's such a great point. Uh, I was just going to ask you, Maddie, 
to that point, what are some ways like you've worked in this environment where you've been testing these counterintuitive things for nonprofit leaders listening to this, trying to think about how do you incorporate uh, this into your nonprofit? And then how do you create an environment where it's safe to make counterintuitive tests? Because a lot of them will fail. So what are some ways that you've seen working and doing this firsthand? Yeah, I think the real key here is the word test. I think often kind of leaders get scared. I mean, naturally get scared by the word counterintuitive or the thought of doing something different because there's obviously a certain level of kind of risk associated with that. So I think the key is really the word test and starting small, running a few kind of small experiments that almost have no risk attached because you're only running it on a small sample, but the potential gains could be massive. So I think it's partly just knowing that start small and then roll out based on what you were, uh, what you learn and adopting that kind of test, learn, adapt mindset is really, really key. I think having two budgets, two sets of metrics and two sets of incentives, which is exploit versus explore. So don't get me wrong, it'd be utterly silly to learn something in a test and then fail to exploit it rationally by doing more of it. And um, patently make the most of what you know, but always invest 20% in what you don't yet know. And that's the kind of fat tail opportunity. And there's a, I, I'm sorry, Madeline, you're going to have to listen to this again. Bees do this fascinating thing where 20% of bees, it varies hugely, but 20% of bees roughly ignore the waggle dance. And people go, well, that's inefficient. You've got this fantastic signaling system which tells you where to find nectar and pollen. Why don't you devote 100% of your resources? Now, of course, one, the environment's already changing. That's true for bees and it's true for us, you know. You know, what would have worked, direct mail might have not worked 10 years ago, it might work today. In bees, you know, cows can break into a field and eat all the flowers. Suddenly, a new meadow can come into bloom magnificently. And the bees understand, and they, they modeled it as a complex system, that if you don't have these rogue bees, the hive gets trapped in a local maximum and eventually starves to death. But also, it never knows how to get lucky. It never has any really big positive upside where a random bee journey, completely ignoring the wobble dance, suddenly stumbles on a supply, you know, the payback there. Now, people are often bonused purely on not failing. And I think you've got to separate this. You've got to say, okay, this part of our budget is for exploiting what we already know. This is the waggle dance part of our business. And then we need to have a rogue bee part of our business where failure is, is common, indeed is possibly even expected, but the way you measure it is over a long time frame, which is does that experimentation over the course of two or three years deliver, you know, three, four, 10, 20 insights, which actually make a huge difference once you then inform the, the waggle dance bees of your new finding. And, and having only one set of metrics or siloing organizations. So a lot of people are siloed into digital marketing and they're bonused on how much money they raise in digital marketing. Now, the gift of digital marketing is it's the Galapagos Islands. It's an experimenter's paradise because you can test things really inexpensively for a very short time. You can kill them incredibly quickly if they don't work. And yet, because these people who are responsible for digital fundraising typically rewarded only on incremental improvement, not on wild experiments, they have an, an unnatural aversion to experimentation because in the short term, it's costly. I think also it's worth uh, just a point to build on that. It's worth kind of people remembering that often you can actually learn a lot more from things that fail than from things that can succeed. And I think just to touch on a point you mentioned Rory earlier about um, this trial we did where we were trying to encourage people to fill out the gift aid form, uh, kind of saying by boost your donation by 25% for free. feels like such an easy win. Why would that not increase uptake? Actually, it completely flopped for various different reasons. Uh, but actually, even though it failed, it told us a lot about actually how we should be framing gift aid in a way that doesn't crowd out pro-social motivations for donating, but actually helps people see the benefit in a way that aligns with why they're donating in the first place. So I think even though it failed, it told us a lot that we could then go on to apply in the future, which was just as valuable, if not more. And then what you might do is test not putting gift aid prominently on the front, but putting it as an additional encouragement when it comes to the donation form. And you might find a totally different response, by the way. Uh, but it does tell you what not to do, which is do not lead on gift aid. And 
Um, it's well, I, I think Manny's point is fantastic, which is that it's not just that there are illogical things that pay off spectacularly. There are logical things which would be approved by a committee in two minutes because they seem to make sense, which are still worth testing because you can't confidently, just because they're consistent with economic models of rationality doesn't mean they really work. And to that point, like, do you think it's better in, as a team to have like certain people that are dedicated to kind of these wild tests, the rogue bees, to, or is it better to like, and then you have people who are more in the, you know, keeping the hive alive, working that way, or is it just at certain points you should try make sure it, whenever you're testing, you're throwing in this kind of some wild cards? I suppose we're a bit of a wild bee organization in that we tend to be brought in when people have become prisoners of their own rationality. You know, they've become trapped by, uh, in a local maximum indeed, by you know, a series of assumptions. And I always say the reason behavioral science is a wonderfully creative field is, first of all, once you admit psychology into the picture, the size of the solution space increases enormously. It's a messier solution space, but it's much, much bigger. Okay. And the second thing is a great deal of creativity is that nearly always when there's a problem, there's a widespread assumption which is wrong. And the act of creativity is often actually strangely negative. It's almost creative destruction. It's finding out something that everybody believes must be true that ain't so. And actually, you know, quite a lot of, if you think about it, quite a lot of creative art, Picasso works on exactly that. It's what you abandon that makes you creative, not what you actually do. Right. That's such a great point. Well, I want to be conscious of time. And, you know, with this show, we like to have it all about taking action and people listening to the show, these nonprofit leaders. You know, what's one thing you would challenge them to do based on listening to this show? And I'll ask you first, Madeline, and then I'll go to you, Rory. I mean, I guess the obvious answer is to test counterintuitive things, but more specifically, I think just start running small scale trials to test new ways of thinking. I think kind of encourage your teams to think outside the box. I think kind of diversity of thought is really, really powerful in getting to new ideas. Um, so to your point earlier, actually bringing people from different parts of the organization together to come up with ideas could spark something completely new. Um, so I think creating that kind of diversity of a thought environment and then starting just to run small scale trials to test and see what works. And I think there is no kind of magic answer and no one size fits all. But I think by testing in your own organization, you can figure out what works best for you and, and your audiences. And I suppose I have to end with a bit of a sales pitch, which is do get in touch with us or with other behavioral science practices that are available because they will sometimes give you, first of all, their learnings elsewhere. The great thing is that all those glorious anomalies uh, that we discover, behavioral science gives us a framework on which to hang them. And you can, you can repeat them either identically in some cases, or you can kind of repeat the same finding thematically by understanding what underlies it. And that's a really, really interesting thing to do. So there is a good repository of knowledge. You'll discover, you know, you also may occasionally need behavioral science people just to encourage you and to give you a license to do things which your bosses would think were crazy if you tried to do them in the house. A wonderful finding, not really relevant to the charity sector, but the best way to sell dollar fries for KFC in Australia, the headline was taken from a legal restriction. And the headline was maximum four per customer. It was the most persuasive thing in getting people to take up this offer compared to anything to do with price or quality or savings or anything of the kind. And uh, sometimes you know, our service, I think, to, the, to what you might call to general creativity and experimentation is partly in widening the solution space. It's partly in providing people with a license to think instinctively without being accused of being mad. Because nearly everybody in your sector, I bet, has an instinctive belief somewhere. And they go, if only I could find a way to justify this, I could test it. And the great thing about behavioral science is it does provide you with the body of scientific knowledge somewhere, which justifies your intuition. Right. That's such a great point. Well, and I would say one other final thing, just to plug your book, Alchemy. It's one of the most fantastic books I read in the last year. You can pick it up on Amazon and a whole bunch of 
you know, Barnes and Noble, all these different things. And I would say one thing that's really fascinating about your book, Rory, is the footnotes that you have in your book. I don't think I've laughed harder reading footnotes in a book as you read through it because they're it's like reading and then listening to your offhand comments that you would make as you're going through the book. So I would say be sure to pick up a copy of Alchemy, you know, limit four per customer. Right. There we are. <laughs> but, exactly. Yeah. Worth it for the footnotes alone, somebody said in a review. Well, that's good enough. <laughs> yes. No, it really is. It's really a fun book. You learn a ton and I've given it away to... Uh, probably half a dozen people already this year. Thank you. Keep going. More. Yeah. yeah love it. <laughs> so where can people find out more about Ogilvy and then you guys personally? Great question. So we actually have a behavioral science platform called Obehave. So if you kind of want to find out more about um, our behavioral science thinking, we have a series of kind of blog articles and podcasts with practitioners and academics in the field. So that's definitely a great place to go if you want to find out more, um, as well as you can find us on the, the Ogilvy website generally. And also Nudge Stock. So we do an annual now virtual festival of behavioural science. It was over 14 hours in June. And we had 120,000 people at the height, uh, proving that behavioural science is not quite a niche anymore. And uh, we'll be obviously running that in June. But all the film footage is up there on YouTube. In fact, if you search for Nudge Stock, as in Woodstock, only with Nudge, Nudge Stock 2020, uh, you'll find the footage out, out there. And um, uh, on Twitter, you'll have to remind me, Mary, of the Ogilvy Twitter address, because that's always a good way to get in touch, actually. Oh, you're testing me now. I should know this. I should know it as well. I'm... Well, we can put it in the show notes if you guys don't have it. That's yeah, okay. put it in the show notes by all means. But um, both of us are on Twitter, and uh, it, it's a pleasure to hear from you. And, you know, by all means, send us just really small questions or things that have been puzzling you. And one favour, if you come across something really counterintuitive and strange that really doesn't make sense, let us know, because... We might be able to make sense of it. You never know. That's great. Well, thank you both, Maddie and Rory, for being on the show. It's been a pleasure talking with you, and it's been just a fun conversation. Likewise. Thank you, Trevor. It's been fantastic. Thank you. No, it's been great. Thank you. Thanks for listening. To learn more about Seven Figure Fundraising and our training, visit sevenfigurefundraising.com. Finally, if there's one person you know would benefit from hearing this episode, please take a minute and share it with them. Thanks. Thanks.